Hello and welcome to Guessing the Specialist Exam Part 3. Last year it was me guessing it, this year it's my past students. Super clever people, super nice people. Maybe you should check out their website, maybe get a job with them next year if you rate yourself when it comes to maths. They've got this good stuff, go to the website. Let's do the first question. Alright, there it is, have a try at it, see how you go. I'm going to do it now. Uh, now this question, I really need to give a shout out to a student I met over the holidays, Keely. Keely, I told you that the right hand rule wasn't going to help you in your exams. I'm eating my words here because here it is. Um, for those of us who know the right hand rule and know it well, it's not going to be a problem. So here's how you do it. Take your right hand, point the index finger at the first vector in your cross product, point your next finger, your middle finger, at the second one, so A times B, and wherever your thumb is, is where the answer will be. So if you can do that, the answer to this is super straightforward. The answer is A. Um, what if you didn't know that? What could you do instead? Well, we only want to really figure out the direction, and we can do that by looking at vector A right there and saying, okay, let's assume vector A is just one in the uh, I direction, right? Because I direction is kind of out of the page, right? So we can say that vector A is just equal to 1, 0, 0. And similarly, we can say vector B is just 1 in the J direction. So B is equal to 0, 1, 0. Now, if we do that cross product, 1, 0, 0 times 0, 1, 0, and you can use your formula sheet to do that, formula sheet, something like that, when you do that, you'll get an answer of 0, 0, 1, which is 1 in the direction straight up, which is our answer there, A. If you reversed the order, if you did B times A, you wouldn't get 0, 0, 1, you'd get 0, 0, negative 1, and the answer would be this one here. This is B times A, not A times B. Hope that's not too confusing. Right hand rule or just sub in some, some standard values to figure out whether it's going up or down. Celebration, next question. All right, some sort of vector equation here, have a try. All right, I'm gonna have a go at this. Now, these questions can be tricky because just because you're given two points doesn't mean that they're gonna, one of those points is gonna be the starting position or the direction is gonna be just as simple as subtracting one from the other, but hopefully it is. So let's use that as our starting point. You should have the vector equation of a line in your head as being A plus TD where A is some starting point, right? Now, when I look at these two points here, I see a negative one, negative three, four. I see a negative one, negative three, four in option A, and I see a negative one, negative three, four in option C. I don't know why it's just I, J, K and I, J, K in B and D, but it feels like I should use negative one, negative three, four as my starting position because I think that's what the question writers have done. So sometimes it pays in multiple choice questions to look at the answers first. All right, so we've got negative i minus three j plus four k plus t. All right, and then we need some sort of direction. The direction is gonna be uh, the difference between the two vectors. So I'm going to just, it could be either one, right? It could be from like two minus one, or it could be minus one minus two. I'm going to go that way. So two minus minus one is three. Five minus minus three is eight. And four minus four is zero, zero. All right, so I have an answer here of negative i minus 3j plus 4k, and then I have like a 3i plus 8j plus 0k. Hmm. Okay, so I had a, I thought maybe a, 
Um, and that's just got negative i minus 2j. No k. That's interesting. Well, what about c? That's got 6i plus 16j. Hmm. Okay. And this is a really important idea. This direction here, right? We've chosen a direction between those two points. But if this particle was moving faster, we would just increase the magnitude of this direction, right? Because this t, it, it's a variable, but we can think of it as, as time, right? In one second, it travels this far. But we just want a line. So maybe it's moving faster than that. Any multiple of this will do. In this case, option C is interesting to me because 6i plus 16j, I can just double these. 6i plus 16j. Okay, I'm pretty confident, so still bring that one down there. I feel like the answer is C. Hopefully you've got something out of that. Um, we've got a starting position. Could have chosen anything. Could have been those two points. Could have been something different. I looked at my questions. I took a look. The direction value, it could be anything. It could be, uh, well, it couldn't be anything. It's got to be a multiple of the, the direction between those two points. It's got to be a multiple of the direction between those two points. It could have been negative 3i minus 8j. It could have been like the other direction, right? It's just a line between two points. The direction is what matters, not the size of the direction. I hope that, I hope that makes sense. I'm going to celebrate. Next question. Okay, what's going on with this question? Have a try. Do it. Okay, so there's drugs going into this patient's body. There's drugs leaving this patient's body. We're trying to come up with a rate for the total change. Right, so nice way to do this is to consider the change in and the change out, and then bring them together at the end. Right, and it's changing the amount with respect to time, the amount with respect to time. All right, the out one is a little bit easier because it says the drug is filtered out of the bloodstream at a rate directly proportional to the amount, Km. Right, And then it says that there is a rate constant of 0.5 milligrams per centimeter cubed. All right, so that means that it is leaving the system, um, the, the rate at which the, the stuff, the medicine, is leaving the system is equal to 0.5 M, the, where M is the amount that's currently in the system. Okay, what about the in bit? Okay, in's a little trickier because it's coming in, there's liquid coming into the body at a rate of 75 centimetres per hour, right? But the fluid, the 75 centimetres cubed per hour, each centimetre only contains 10 milligrams of solution, right? So 75 times 10. This is really a related rates question where 75 is the units for that are centimeters cubed per hour. And the 10, the units for that are milligrams per centimeter cubed. Right? And when we cancel those out, we get milligrams per hour. And that's also what we've got here, milligrams per hour. Okay. 75 times 10, 750. All right, that's in. It's coming in at a rate of 750 milligrams per hour. It's going out at a rate of 0.5 M milligrams per hour. In total, our answer is D. The rate at which it's changing in the body is 750 minus 0.5 milligrams per hour. Okay. Uh, I'm feeling good. Next question. These are two wonderful questions. Uh, these are questions that students have trouble with because there's no numbers in sight. You've got to go pure algebraic. All right, so we're trying to prove the following properties. So let's do part A first, and then we're going to do part B. They work slightly differently. I like having these two here. All right, uh, it says Z plus W, the conjugate of Z plus W, 
is equal to the conjugate of z plus the conjugate of w. Before I start, I want to draw a picture because what I want to do is get an intuitive understanding of what this means. All right, some of you are not going to love this. This is my complex number z on an argon diagram. Um, I'll make like a, a W, right? Let's make it, let's, let's not overcomplicate things. Let's make W look like that. All right. Now, if I do Z plus W, Z plus W, I'll get something that looks like that. This point is Z plus W. Okay. If I take the conjugate of Z plus W, which is what this is, right? That's down here. Right, it's a reflection over the x axis, over the x axis. That is the conjugate of z plus w. Okay, uh, now the right hand side, the conjugate of z, that's the conjugate of z, the conjugate of w. If I add those together, conjugate of z, conjugate of w, I end up in the same place. Hopefully, you can see that. So, as a picture, it works, but that doesn't help us at all. I just wanted to show it to you because I think it's cool. Okay, algebra time. So we're going to let z equal a plus b i, and we're going to let w equal c plus d i. Good place to start. All right. Uh, now we have a. We're doing part a here. We have a left hand side equal to the conjugate of z plus w. The conjugate of z plus w. Now, we have a right-hand side. I'll do that sort of up here a little bit. We have a right-hand side equal to the conjugate of z plus the conjugate of w. All right, let's put some stuff in here. We have a plus b i plus c plus d i, the conjugate of that. I'm going to do the same here. I'm not going to keep working on the left-hand side right-hand side, but I think it's important to get the stuff in there so we sort of know what's going on. A plus B I, the conjugate of that, plus C plus D I, the conjugate of that. Now, look at how I've set this up. Left-hand side, right-hand side. I've made a tiny bit of progress on both. And now just look at them and say, well, can I do a thing on either side? It doesn't matter which one. Oh, okay. I know what the conjugate of A plus BI is. The conjugate of A plus BI is A minus BI. That's literally the definition of the conjugate. Plus C minus DI. Okay. That, that, that it doesn't feel like I can, I can maybe group some stuff, but I'm going to leave it like that for now. I would love it if that looked like that. All right, the key insight here is to understand that this is a real number, and this is a real number, and this is the imaginary component, and this is the imaginary component. Because if we want to find the conjugate of a complex number, we need the real component plus the imaginary component, or minus, because then we just change that plus or minus sign. So I'm going to rewrite this now as a plus c, where that is the real component, plus b plus d i, right, where that is the imaginary component. Okay, but I'm still, I still haven't conjugated it, I still haven't got the conjugate, but now I will. a plus c, the plus becomes a minus b plus d, I. Okay, it's worth pausing and sort of looking at what we've got. I feel like uh, you could go either way here. You could work here, you could work here, but I feel I feel like I'm going to have a little more success working here. A plus C, A plus C, minus BI minus DI. Okay, A plus C minus B plus D I. Is that the same as that? Yeah, it is, right? 
If I expanded this, I'd get negative B times I, so negative BI, negative DI. Great. We're done. We've proven it. Uh, the left-hand side equals the right-hand side quad erat demonstratum. Proven. Uh, I really like that. I think it's very clever. And it does come up in this sort of idea where you're proving properties. does come up in the um, externals. You want to practice it. I love it. That's a good question. What about part B? I really like part B. It's very, very clever. The reason I like part B is because it's going to push us to sort of maybe expand our way of thinking of the conjugate. All right, because I'm seeing this conjugate of z to the n equals conjugate of z to the power of n. So that's splitting my mind in two, because in the one hand, I'm looking at, at z to the n, and I'm thinking polar. If I was in polar form, that would be better, right? Cartesian form raised to powers is horrible. Polar form raised to powers is neat. However, I've got these conjugates floating about, and when I think of conjugates, I think of Cartesian form. That's my default. So that feels like a, a tension, right? But luckily for me, I love to draw a picture. So we're going to expand our minds here by thinking about the conjugate a different way. Here is just a random complex number, we'll call that z. Now, we can express z in polar form. If we know the magnitude of z and if we know the argument, we can say that um, it is z cis theta. The conjugate of z cis theta is a reflection over the x-axis. And so that means that the conjugate, if this is z, if z equals the magnitude of z cis theta, then the conjugate of z is equal to same length z cis negative theta. If this is not a definition of a conjugate that you have in your head, I this is cool because we're going to use this in part b. All right, so this time I'm going to let z equal, I don't know, just like a cis theta. All right, so we have our left-hand side here is equal to z to the n, but the conjugate of it. And we have our right-hand side, which I'll do up here, as the conjugate of z then raised to the power of n. And we need to make those equal to each other. All right, z is not z. Z is a cis theta. Uh, um, we've replaced z with it. We're raising a cis theta to the power of n and then the conjugate of it. a cis theta to the n, the conjugate of it. All right, we know how to raise these things to the power of n. That's going to be a to the n cis n theta and I want the conjugate of that. And from what we just spoke about earlier, finding the conjugate in polar form, very easy. Same magnitude, but cis negative n theta. I'm not going to be able to go any further with that, but this I think we can make some headway on. All right, we have z is a cis theta, the conjugate of it to the power of n. Now we know that the conjugate of a cis theta is a cis negative theta. And we're going to raise all of that to the power of n. And I think we're there. Beautiful. Left hand side equals right hand side. Quad erat demonstratum. Big mathematical flex. Celebrate done. I love that question. So good. So clever. Um, cool. Okay, next question. All right, we have a vector function and we're going to turn it into a Cartesian relation. Try it. Okay, I'm going to do it. Um, 
what have we got? So when we're trying to take a vector equation and transfer it to a Cartesian relation, we've got this is like the x coordinate of like a dot moving through space. And this is the y coordinate of a dot moving through space, right? So we can now say that x equals t plus 3 pi on 4. And we can say that y equals sine 1 half t. Okay, now what should we do here? It, when I see sine and when I see Cartesian stuff, I start thinking about like Pythagorean identities. But I'm balking at that, right? Because yes, I see I see sine here, but I don't see like a cos or a sec or a tan here. And in my experience, normally you would want like trig in both of them for it to work. So I'm going to try something. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. I think if I just rearrange this for t, so t equals something, and then sub it into there, right? So we'll call this equation 1, we'll call this equation 2, we're going to rearrange equation 1 to be t equals x minus 3 pi on 4, okay, um, okay, that feels pretty good actually, because that looks like something that you could just sub into here, and now we're just going to end up with a periodic function, I think. So subbing 1 into 2, I think we're going to get y equals sine 1 half, and then t is not t, it's x minus 3 pi on 4. I feel like I'm done. I'm feeling pretty good about this. Uh, State the domain and range of the relation. So, okay, so I think this is the relation. I think this is where we are. Um, I don't think there's any a big tricks to this. Maybe? No, nope, I'm feeling good. Um, now, roughly sketching this, because it doesn't say that I have to sketch it, but like roughly sketching it, it it's a sine graph uh, with an amplitude of 1. Okay, uh, now it's got some sort of phase shift in it, but I don't really care about that because it just goes on forever and ever and ever. So the important bit, though, is that it goes, has a maximum of 1 and a minimum of negative 1, and it does that. So I can now say that the domain of this is all the real numbers, something a bit more like that. X is in the set of real numbers. And the range, uh, negative 1 is less than or equal to y, which is less than or equal to 1. All right, really like that question. Uh, felt like a little bit of a breather. We've had some tricky ones. Um, something I'll say about this before I get on is that I was thinking about this as I went, right? Um, you could end up really messing yourself up if instead of rearranging equation 1 for t, you rearranged equation 2 for t. You end up with inverse signs and you've got to start doing some weird stuff there. So this is one of those instances where jump in, you can see that I jumped into x equals this and y equals this, but then I did stop for five seconds and think about what would be my next course of action. Is it a trig identities thing? Is it just subbing something into another thing? Something to think about. Did I celebrate? Let's celebrate. Well, that's been part three. Thanks again to my peeps here. Um, go and check out the website. It is super awesome. Uh, but I will see you in the next one.